Are you truly living your moments? That's the question we're going to address today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be heard on the Edify app. Today I have with me Dr. Pamela Prince Pyle. She's a physician chair of the Board of Africa New Life Ministries in Rwanda. She's also an author and international speaker on the topics of global health, equity, evangelism in the workplace, women's discipleship, and ingredients which make for a good death. And that is what we're going to target today. Welcome, Dr. Pyle. I'm so honored to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And uh, please call me Pamela. So, Dr. Pyle, Pamela, tell us what it is about your work that led you to really center on the topic of living like you're dying. Well, one of the things um, that I have seen in, in practicing medicine for over 30 years in hospitals in the United States and villages throughout Rwanda and also being a patient myself is that the dying have a lot to teach us. And once someone is given a terminal diagnosis, their perspective on life changes significantly. And I began just observing and asking questions about what they would have done different, what um, they are happy with the choices that they made. But one patient really changed my entire perspective. and. She was on her deathbed dying, and I had known her from coming in and out of the hospital. And it had been a hard suffering and, and at times a hard dying. But in this moment, I was sitting on the side of her bed and holding her hand, and she was asking me very direct questions about what to expect. And I knew I was going to miss her, and I, I began to weep. And she grabbed my hand with the strength that you you wouldn't expect her to have. And she comforted me with the words, it's okay. It will be a good death. Now, for me and my relationship with her, I knew that her good death was entirely built upon her confidence in her destination. She loved Jesus. She was confident in the heavenly rewards that God has promised. However, the phrase, a good death, wouldn't leave me. And so I began exploring, what are the ingredients of a good death on this side of our last breath? And I explored patient experiences through my years of practice through my time in Rwanda, through friends that had lost children and husbands. And through them all, I found good in death. And so while suffering's hard and pain is hard, I understand that. Dying is hard and grief is hard. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive with good and wonder and gratitude and joy and even hope. So that's been my passion is really sharing this woman's, but also all those that have come before. And it changed my life, how I live my life. I I would describe it as a flourishing life because I'm confident of my destination. But I have three questions that I ask myself. One, am I truly living my moments? Two, am I fully breathing my purpose? And three, am I confident of my destination? And when I can do that on a regular basis, especially one and two, life begins to change. And when others begin that process, they also notice life change, no matter where they are in their life stage. 
So that's kind of a long story of my my journey to uh, this moment. You find that there was a difference between the American culture's focus on a good life and the African culture's focus on a good death. Yes, I mean it's it's tremendously different. Um, I've always said since I started going to Rwanda in, in 2009, the happiest people I've ever met live in a village in East Africa, um, initially in a refugee camp. They're not always sure they're going to get food. They have terrible water. Their children die when they shouldn't. And yet they have hope. They have each other. They believe in God. And they are living a good life. And their good death is surrounded by those that they love, cared for in a tender manner, and not separated from the reality of death which is what we often see here in the U.S., is there's this distance between the final moments and the relationship that we should be having in those final moments and what is actually happening. Do you believe that the African culture focuses more on legacy and we focus more on what we're getting out of our own lives? You know, I think um, each person who I've talked to, whether in Rwanda or here, they want to feel like they have had a meaningful life. And a meaningful life um, is is one that creates legacy. Uh, And so that's pretty universal. We might use the term legacy and they would use um, their language's equivalent of meaningful. But everyone wants to feel like their life mattered while they were here. One of the ingredients uh, that I've written about is being intentional about legacy, both creating a personal legacy statement, a family legacy statement, and it can begin, you, you know, even when you're young, And it may evolve over time, but it changes your life when you're thinking about your legacy, because in many ways, that's the second question. Are you fully breathing your purpose? And legacy is is the imprint we leave on the world that it may not even be attached to our personal name, but it's felt by those that come behind us. I would agree that everybody wants to have a meaningful life, but I wonder if maybe Western culture is so distracted by the busyness of what we think is urgent around us that we miss that intentionality that you're talking about. You know, it's, um, that is very, very, very true. And, uh, one of the chapters, um, in, in the book is called The Magical Good. And I started with a story uh, that occurred. I was just shopping and I hear a voice behind me, Mama, will you love me and remember me in 10 minutes? And the mother says, of course, of course. And she's flipping through the hangers and all I could hear is the hangers flip, flip, flip. And the little girl says, well, mama, will you remember me in an hour? Flip, flip, flip. And so at this point, I glance back and the mother is not engaged at all in the conversation. And then the little girl tugs on the mother and gets her attention enough. Yes, honey, what? Yes, honey, what? And then the little girl says, will you remember me in 10 years? And the woman had become so involved in looking at clothes that she never answered. And I just recognized like how many times I had done that. 
you know, got distracted. And it really started me thinking about how many moments am I missing? And my son and I, he's actually surfing. I'm actually trying to surf. <laughs> but he he was 22 at the time. And um, I asked him if he would help me. And he did. And it was like July 4th and an hour in. I still hadn't gotten up. And he wasn't getting frustrated, which I was thankful for. But I knew he had a date. And I said, Christian, what time's your date? And he said, oh, it was 30 minutes ago. And I said, oh, you need to go. I'm so sorry. And he says, you know what? This is more important. I stopped and breathed in the ocean air, every part of that moment, I will never forget. And that's how I live my moments now. When someone's talking to me, I look at them. I try to be intentional and being kind. Um, at, At least once a day, notice something about someone, whether it's a checkout girl or someone working at a gas station. There's usually something you can compliment them on. And it's such a change in perspective. Like their face lights up and, you know, they notice that they've been noticed. And so that's that's my journey of living my moments. And each person is different. Um, but it's an important one because we're not promised tomorrow. And so living my moments today and knowing my purpose today and my destination prepares me as if death were to come tomorrow. Wow, that is so profound. And we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I want to dive into those last two questions a little bit more and see how maybe we can shift from being so distractible to being more intentional about each of these questions in our lives. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with Dr. Pamela Prince Pyle and how to live like you're dying. Meet the Christian who married faith with true crime, Lori Morrison. Lori is a person of faith, a private investigator, and the producer of the award-winning podcast, The Unlovely Truth, where faith and true crime intersect. Lori and I would like to invite you to join the True Crime Mission Fields Program, a life-changing opportunity exclusively joining Christians who have married faith and true crime. Featuring Chaplain Lori Prather, the products within the True Crime Mission Fields Program allow you to connect your passions and skills as Christians with practical service opportunities within the world of true crime. You will begin to serve people in difficult circumstances and have a greater impact in this world than you ever imagined possible. Access your free report Meet the Christian who married faith with true crime and receive up to 70% off of any collection when you use the link in the show notes. And now we're back. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Pyle. I am so looking forward to seeing how we can, how we can apply these questions to our lives more intentionally, because I think it's easier to be busy and distracted than it is to really think about these things moment by moment and live with intentionality about where we are going and what our purpose is in life. Can you give us some tips on how we can do that? For living intentionally or living our moments, um, there's a lot of words that are uh, synonymous with that and, and the concept of mindfulness is one example of living in our moments, but I prefer to use the word relational mindfulness because it's not only relationship with ourselves and our well-being. It's when our moments collide with others that we need to be mindful. And so one of the examples I uh, used previously is, is being kind randomly. There's a, a goal for each day. If someone's talking to me, a uh, business partner, um, coworker, or a patient, I don't try to do something else while 
they are talking. I'm looking them directly in the eye. And so they know that I'm truly listening, not just hearing. Another example would be if someone, if I've said words that I didn't mean to hurt or offend, but it does, the only way I'm going to know that is the look on their face. Some people, it might be such a minor thing that they wouldn't uh, say, well, that hurt, but you can tell it in their face. And so in my collision of moment, my moments with others, I want to not only hear them, I want to watch their body language so that I know that I am loving in the best way that I can, which is what Jesus calls us to do, love your neighbor that comes through the Holy Spirit. Wow. I love that so much relational mindfulness. I believe that is so important. It is thinking eternally rather than thinking just about what needs to get done today. So that's so, so super important to living your purpose too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And living your purpose is different for everyone and it changes with time. But we know that God has a purpose uh, according to his will. And I want to encourage all of your listeners that that purpose is often beyond just loving your family well. And it, discovering that purpose is a process. It's knowing who you are in Christ. It's listening to the Holy Spirit as things are placed in front of you. Um, but he usually, if you, if you are trustworthy with the small purposes, he begins to place big purposes. And so I kind of followed that principle. Um, once I became a believer, which was in my thirties, uh, and that's one of the reasons I ended up in Rwanda and God very clearly after a week of serving there said, this is your place and this is your purpose. And for all these years since he's never said, now you're done. <laughs> and so uh, what I thought was to build a clinic um, is now a bustling hospital, part of a ministry that. Um, I love with all my mind, heart, mind, and soul is called Africa New Life Ministries. And life change occurs. And we uh, have about 12,000 kids in school. We plant churches. Uh, we're up to about 14 communities. And people come to know the Lord. When you show them the love through acts of compassion, and share the gospel through proclamation. The way you're living it, people are really experiencing Jesus. Yes. And and they want to come along. And it's just, I, I can't express enough. You have to live intentionally on purpose. And just be fully aware, you know, God's got something amazing for you to do. And he's just wanting you to see it. He doesn't make you do it, but he makes it obvious for you. And we just become risk adverse. We might not feel we are equipped. We might feel that that's too big of a thing. But I had a guest on my podcast and she had started a movement um, called Don't Give Up Signs. And and she just said, do the thing, <laughs> you know, do the thing and God will multiply it. You won't regret it. And it's not only for you, it's for your children and your family to see that you care beyond a limited world scope, even if it's one person at a time. Love that. This is so deep and so meaningful. 
I wish we could go on forever about this. I do want to hit one point. Um, talk to us about what it means to have a good death. To me, a good death is the exclamation point on a good life. And so what I describe, a good death is not an event. It's a lifestyle. And that lifestyle, as I mentioned, begins with the more subjective things of living your moments, breathing your purpose. But there's also things that are very critical and crucial to preparing for death that might arrive tomorrow. Being prepared before the crisis happens helps for a good death. The best death is one where you're confident of your destination after your last breath. And that is through Jesus Christ, who came as a savior to kill death on our behalf. And so, so many people will ask me, well, how can you know? How can you know what happens after that last breath? And what I describe to them is I can know because of what God and Jesus have done in my life, this side of that last breath. I know who I was, and I know who I am. And that can only be through a Savior. And so because I believe the Savior, I'm confident of my destination. I just feel like that is the crux of the meaning of life in general. And I want all the listeners to know how they can support your ministry in Africa New Life Ministries and how they can get a copy of this amazing book with all the keys to live your most meaningful life. Well, for Africa New Life, and I, I'd love if you visit their website, it's www.africanewlife.org. And if you decide to sponsor a child through there, um, send them an email and mention my name and when i go to rwanda in july and august i will visit your child and for everything else and how to have a good death i it's been such a passion of mine that my website gives you almost all the information that's in the book and i'm adding content daily it's www.drpamela.com I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. And it's all free resources. And then uh, when you sign to the contact us, or if you have a, a certain need, I will respond. I will pray for you. And when the book comes out, you'll get an early notice. And there's also a sneak peek on that website. And I can't stress enough. I don't want anything from you, but there's a lot for you. And God loves you. It is just so beautiful. I hope that all of you listening were deeply moved by this conversation and by Dr. Pamela Pyle's beautiful offer of wanting to give everything for you to bless you with the best life that you can experience. One that makes for a good death at the end of it. And I'm so grateful to have you on the show today. I hope that all of you listening will take advantage of this opportunity to support Africa New Life Ministries and to avail yourself of these amazing resources that can really enrich your life so you can flourish. And of course, I also hope that you come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be found on the Edify app.